Now, all that Troy said was true, and you have no idea what I paid him to say those words. It was way too much, I'll tell you. He didn't say one thing, though, and that is that I have the best job in the world. I teach American history to young Americans, and it just doesn't get any better than that. Now, you hear a lot of hooing and hawing about what's going on with the youth of today and all of that. Let me tell you, they're just fine. Leave them alone. They're just fine, right? They love their history. They love their country. And I wish more of them could be here today. Today, of course, we are in the presence of these fine men. We, it would be an understatement, <clears throat> understatement to say that we are in the presence of greatness. By any definition of greatness. It would be an understatement to say that we are in the presence of men who know the true meaning of sacrifice to a depth that most of us cannot even imagine. It would be true to say that we are in the presence of men who have lived their lives by a code of dedication and devotion to the right. All of these things we could say about these men. We're going to have these men, fortunately, talk to us today. Now, when I was thinking about what to ask, <clears throat> you know, we could have gone big picture, you know, there I was, right? I was saying, what do I do now, right? Yeah, we could have done that, right? But what I want to do here today, if, fine, if it's all right with, with you gentlemen, is try to touch on the personal side of these men. What has happened to them in their life? What happened to them in their time of national service? How they perceived it? What it meant to them? And what they think it meant to the country? So a little bit of the personal side. First, a short introduction of these men. Mr. Marvin Letty, first here. Mr. Letty was born right here in Abilene. He was drafted into the Army in 1944. Upon completion of his basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia, he was assigned to the 738th Medium Tank Battalion. He shipped out for England in April 1944, just prior to the Normandy invasion. In November of 1944, his battalion entered the fighting in the European theater of operations. Mr. J. Irwin Kramer. Mr. Kramer joined the Army in April of 1945. He completed his basic training at Camp Fannin in Texas. He was initially assigned to Fort Ord, California, and then was transferred a short distance to the east, like Tokyo. In September of 1945, he was transferred again, this time plumb out of the Army. He was transferred from the Army to the Army Air Force. While in Tokyo, he underwent technical training and communications. And upon completion of his schooling, he was assigned to a, to a communications unit in Tokyo, where his duties included sending out weather reports and landing instructions, approaching the islands of Japan from Okinawa. Mr. Kramer was discharged in January of 1947. Mr. Luis Graziano. Luciano Luis Graziano is from Thompson, Georgia. It says here that he is a living piece of history and indeed he is, the best kind. He's 96 years old, World War II veteran. He's here to tell his story to us about himself and about his experiences in the war. Mr. Graziano has lived in Thompson, Georgia for 63 years and is still working part-time there. 
He's an active member of his church. He has five children, and we hope most of them are here today. Mr. Graziano is the author of a book, A Patriot's Memoirs of World War II, in which he provides a very candid account of what it was like to be a young soldier during and immediately following World War II. Mr. Graziano speaks in that book, and he will speak to us today from personal experiences, because he personally witnessed many of the war's most important moments. Like what? Well, like this. He landed with the third wave at Omaha Beach on D-Day. He fought in the Battle of the Bulge. And he's, I'm told, the only living individual who was standing in the room in Reims, France, when the instrument of surrender was signed by the Germans. In his book, Mr. Graziano calls on Americans to, quote, look back to our history and to help us appreciate how we became the greatest nation on earth and appreciate the men and the women who made this happen. Mr. Bob Cook. Mr. Bob Cook was born in St. Francis, Kansas. He enlisted in the Army, received his initial training at Fort Logan, Colorado. Prior to his deployment to the European theater, he completed airborne training, became a paratrooper. During his service, Mr. Cook participated in the airborne assault across the Rhine River. He was a member of the force that freed Italian prisoners of war from German camps. And he also served in the contingent that guarded General Eisenhower at his headquarters in Berlin. Mr. Cook's awards and decorations include the Parachute Badge, the American Theater Service Medal, and the World War II Victory Medal. He currently lives in Salina, Kansas. And last but not least, down there on the end, Mr. Frank Bentiman. Mr. Bentiman was born in Frankfort, Kansas. He was drafted into the Army in 1944, underwent initial training at Fort Leavenworth, right here in Kansas. He served in the 79th Division in both the European Theater and in Panama. Mr. Bentiman was awarded the Purple Heart for injuries he suffered in fighting at the Rhine River on 24 March 1945. He is also a recipient of the Bronze Star and the Combat Infantryman's Badge. When he returned home after the war, he spearheaded the drive to rename a section of Highway 99 in Frankfort, Kansas, in honor of the Frankfort Boys. And he was successful. Mr. Benton, Benjamin currently resides in Topeka with his wife, Anne. So that's a short introduction of the men who will be gracing us with their stories, experiences today. And if it's okay with you gentlemen, I think we'll start down there on the end with Mr. Benjamin. And sir, I'm going to ask all of you the same question. What is your most vivid memory of your first day in the military. <laughs> oh, you're asking me? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Only you, sir. Uh, I, I don't know, but the first day I come out of a repo depot in France somewhere and was taken up to uh, uh, an outfit that ended up to be in the 79th Infantry Division. It was night, and that was the first time I ever heard artillery fire. Uh, I do not know where it was at. I, I look in my book a lot of times trying to figure out where it was at, but I cannot figure out where it was at. Um, it, it, I became a first scout, and I was a replacement for somebody who'd never come back. I, I have no idea who. Uh, I'll let somebody else go some, a little farther away. All right, sir. Go. Yep. Well, maybe you didn't know where the artillery was coming from, but you did know where it landed, and that wasn't on you, right? Yeah, so. it, was, it was going out. Okay, outgoing. I, I, had, I had never heard artillery 
outfit in my life, even at training at Camp Fan in Texas. Yeah. I'd never heard that before. Yeah. Okay, sir. Mr. Cook, first day in service. Oh, I don't know. First day. I don't know. I'd, I'd just say any day. It's all about light. But when you jump, when jumping out of a plane, and when that chute opens and you're on the ground almost immediately, that way you're out of fire. That uh, and you had to make your way around and make sure you had everything. And of course, all I had was a rifle. That's all I had to be responsible of. So I had the M1 rifle. And I did what I had to do. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Graziano, first day in the military. Uh, first day when I got inducted, and uh, the uh, captain come to me and he says, you got to cut your mustache off. <laughs> <laughs> I says, for what? He says, cut it off or else. And I didn't want to know what else was, so I went ahead and cut it off. <laughs> And then I was transferred, a few days later, I was transferred to Camp Hood, Texas. It, and I, uh, first day I got down there, they told me I had to peel six bushels of potatoes with two other men. So we did that. Then I was transferred to 13 weeks of combat training. And one morning, I was late coming in from Reveille, and the captain made me run around the barracks building 20 times for being late. So I was never late again. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that 13 weeks training, I was sent to uh, Camp Shanks, New York, for four weeks of special training. And then I, uh, after those four weeks of special training, I was sent to Fort Dix, New Jersey, to get ready to go overseas. And the night before I got on the ship, I went to town and made a record for my father. And on my father, for my father and I, on that record I had said to him that I, everything we were going to do when we got over there to Mussolini. And everything I said we were going to do happened just like I said on that record. So, I don't know how. I <laughs> and and then, then I got on the Queen Mary ship with, there was 16,082 troops on that ship. And then the bear and um, bunks we had. You slept on the bunks one night and on the deck the next night. So I slept on the bunk the first night, and I wanted to turn over, and I couldn't turn over. I had to get out and get, get back in to turn over. So I told them the next day they can have the bunks. I'll sleep on the deck every night. <laughs> so, uh, and then as we were traveling to, uh, they didn't tell us where we were going until the third day out on the ship. And the U-boats were chasing us and we had to change course every six minutes, zigzag. And after a few days, the storm came up. And between the U-boats and the storm, they had to change course and we had to go to Scotland instead. So we got to Scotland. Then we had to take a train to go to West, West Camp in uh, England. And when I got to England, the uh, General Thrasher come up to me and told me he wanted to send me on a special mission. And the mission was to, for me to go to London, and I was not supposed to tell nobody what he had me to do there. And I still hadn't told nobody. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was there. And the V1s and V2s, the Germans would send down to the, uh, and you just didn't know if he was going to get hit or not. Those, they would come down whistling and then explode. So if I was walking down the sidewalk, I'd just lay down and put my hands over my head 
till it exploded. And the Lord was with me and I didn't get hit. And I was there for about six weeks before I went back to Camp Weston. And then when I got back to Camp Weston, Captain Moore sent for me and he said, you gotta go to the barber shop. I said, for what? He said, the barber's sick and you gotta take over the barber shop. I says, how do you know I can cut hair? He says, I checked your records and saw you was a hairstylist in New York. So I changed hats and went to the barber shop. That was after two weeks. Well the, well, the first one to come in to get a haircut was a general. I said, oh, hell to myself. <laughs> <laughs> but it turned out good. He liked it and everything was fine. I was there for two weeks and the barber came back and took over. And I was back out with my men. And then I was, uh, the uh, Colonel Boschoff come up and he says, I'm going to appoint you to utility NCO sergeant. And he gave me 35 men to work with me. And we had to put up 50 Nissan huts and 40 tents with so many troops coming in to be trained. So I got that job done. And uh, let's see, it was a lot of other stories I could tell, but it would go on and on. <laughs> but let's see, after that, I... All right, then one, then one time when I was working out there with the major, and he was an engineer, and then General Thrasher come up and told him to use, get those uh, prefab huts and make a big mess hall for the troops coming through. So he monkeyed about six weeks, uh, about three weeks with that and couldn't quite figure it out. We, then we, we was out there again, I was working under him and uh, General said, you hadn't done nothing. He says, I'm still trying to work out to figure it out. The general looked at me, he says, can you do it? I said, yes, sir, general. I says, can you and I step aside? He says, okay, major, you stay there. I says, general, I want to use the, some two guards that can speak German and English, and I want to use the German prisoners to do it with. He says, you got it. So he left, and, and the major says, you're no engineer, how are you going to do it? I says, I'm going to do it, but I wouldn't tell him how I was going to do it. <laughs> so, so the next thing you know, I got it up for about three weeks, I got the mess hall built, and then the general transferred the major out and put me in charge of the city of Reims, France, and the little red school house took his place. And then, let's see, I, uh, I, know, I just missed my mind now. What else I got? Better. We'll come back. <laughs> we'll be back. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of other stories, but we, oh, well, another story I can tell you about the, well, the, uh, my buddy, he says, let's go to the ball game and watch the ladies play ball. I says, okay, ain't got nothing to do tonight. So we went there and uh, this one girl caught my eye that was playing ball. She was the pitcher. I says, who's that girl? And his, my buddy's girlfriend says, she's my best friend, Bobby. I says, okay. So the next day I went to the early room where she worked and talked with her for a while and made a date with her for that night. When I went to pick her up, I went over there and the girls there at the office said, she's already left with somebody. <laughs> so nothing I can do, go back to camp. So, and then, then her friends told her that she'd never get another date with me. 
And she, she told me, yes, she would. So in about two or three weeks, I went back and asked for a date again. And this time she was there. And we've been there together ever since 63 years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think that. Mr. Kramer. Yes. First day. J. J. A. Y. First day in the military. <laughs> what, what, what do you remember? What was your impression? What surprised oh, you? Oh, well, the first day was Fort, Fort Leverworth. And of course, first day you. Uh, I don't know, the first day, the first thing you had to do was strip down and get about a half a dozen shots. <laughs> and, maybe, and then uh, after that, we went through all basic training, and I was sent to Fort Ord, California. And then from Fort Ord, California, I was sent to, went to Yokohama, Japan. Uh, my my term in in service was, was from, of course, shortly before end of the European War, and then while I was in, the basic they, they dropped the bombs, of course, and that ended the war in the Pacific, which uh, was uh, a lot of people had questions about. You know, dropping atomic bombs, it, it killed an awful, awful lot of people. But it saved an awful lot of GI lives. Mm. And uh, putting everybody I talked to was glad they dropped the bombs. And uh, the guys that, if you was seen Japan, you know, we realized that uh, the Japanese people were going to fight to the end. Uh, they, the Japanese, as you know, in Okinawa, there was all a lot of the war fought was fought in underground. And the Japanese had a tendency to do a lot of uh, tunneling, <laughs> and they. Uh, that's what happened in, in Okinawa. They, they took a, practically had to dig them out, and uh, a lot of uh, lives was lost in Okinawa. But then uh, it also saved a lot of lives later on because uh, Japan itself, I think, would be in, was full of caves. I mean, that's and people was ready to to fight to the death. And uh, I think the atomic bombs ended that. Uh, if you see the destruction in Japan, it was uh, the bomb bombings before the atomic bombs. There was not too much left around Tokyo. It was, most of it was burnt. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing that was left was the emperor's palace. For some reason, it was right in the middle of Tokyo, and then it was never touched. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but uh, the Empress Palace was a big boat surrounded by water, and uh, they never, it was never bombed. Uh, everything else around it was pretty much, the only thing left in Japan was, uh, I think they burned a lot of coal, because. It's full of smokestacks. <laughs> and uh, when we landed in Yokohama and uh, took trains up to Tokyo, uh, I think we traveled alongside <laughs> where the, the bomb was dropped. And <clears throat> there was nothing left but uh, smokestacks. I don't know why them things were never destroyed, but they, they stood up amongst nothing but ashes. Uh, there's an awful lot of civilians killed by the bombs, but it saved an awful lot of lives as far as American troops are concerned. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you won't find an American soldier that would say he thought it was the wrong thing to do. Uh, 
Truman had to make that decision of dropping the bombs. And uh, uh, it, like I say, it saved an awful lot of lives because you would never have taken Japan without an awful lot of, of fighting. Uh, after a, uh, After I got in Japan, uh, you know, the people there was, uh, they were not, uh, had no animosity towards the Shia. Practice, they didn't have much to say to them at all. Uh, They were, uh, uh, you know, Japan people lived a lot on rice and fish. And yet, yet, if you combine the two, the odor is not too good. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, they, uh, they all, all of them carried a little tin can. And you could bet if you had to examine, which we had to sometimes, it had it was, became contained rice and fish. Uh, <coughs> if they practically lived on it, I think. Uh, after I was in Japan a while, uh, I got to think that the, the, the people was all all together a lot like us. I mean, as far as you know, yeah, everybody is. The world over is like getting it's that much. You, 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 the common people is so it's much different in Japan as they are in a lot of countries. Uh, they have the upper class, and they would, and they, they call the geisha girls. Uh, they weren't considered. Uh, probably a lot of them thought of a geisha girl as a a prostitute or something, but he was not. They were not. They were very dignified ladies and dressed accordingly. Very well dressed person. And they took, they were like a servant to a lot of the upper class men. Uh, as far as, you know, uh, the people of Japan, when I first got on the streets, the, 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 the men and the women, was, the bathrooms was communal. And uh, that was hard to get used to. Yeah. And uh, yeah. a lot of them bathrooms, you would not like to do, use them because they consisted of a <clears throat> of a trench right down the middle of, of the room with running water, <laughs> and uh, then people would straddle it to use it in the bathroom. Men and women alike. Uh, that was a hard thing to get used to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, combat, <laughs> combat comes but, uh, in all forms. Uh, right? uh, it does. Yeah, but in, in Japan, uh, the USO was a great organization. Uh, it provided a, an entertainment for a lot of the troops, and uh, was a great organization. A lot of of name brands, name names, big names that came over and entered grand troops. And it was through the USO. <coughs> Uh, I can't say too much about uh, what I thought about you about as far as, you know, they, they always wonder about MacArthur. He was, uh, him and Truman did not get along. Uh, and you, that, that yeah. was probably common history. Uh, Eisenhower 
an altogether different. He, Ike was well thought of by everybody. Uh, Truman uh, did not, I, I think, did not get along with MacArthur. And you, after you see I mean, MacArthur, I, I think I've seen him once when I was in Tokyo. Uh, he, you can always recognize me because he always had a pipe in his mouth. Uh, but, you know, you don't hear much about MacArthur because he just more or less, uh, you know, he said that was his common thing was, uh, I shall return, that expression, when he left the Philippines and when he came back after afterwards. Uh, that's about all of my experiences as far as uh, after I left, got transferred to the Air Force, and, and I was and learned how to do Morse code. It was a crash course. And if you ever learn how to learn how to hear did da did da da did da, you know, and that's all Morse code, and that's the way all the uh, all the conversation we had between us and the airplanes that was flying in from Okinawa to Tokyo. And we had to send planning instructions and weather reports. And uh, uh, we, we, had, we went to school in Tokyo to learn how to do that Morse code. And uh, if you ever try to do Morse code, it's, you have to be... Uh, you need to do it about a couple of years to really know how. Mm -hmm. Some of them guys could do Morse code about as fast as you could talk. Uh, I could not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, we learned that the best we could, but because uh, we took over for guys that had points, got enough points to go home and. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes we had a, quite a lot of problems talking to these guys that flying in from Okinawa because they uh, they knew how to do all this stuff and uh, they kind of wanted to they sent a, a message, put a qualified operator on so they could talk a little better. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we done the best we could, but anyway, that was my experience as far as, as being in the, the, I was stationed there in Tokyo for several, for a year, uh, and that was my job. I mostly was <clears throat> in the aircraft coming in from to Okinawa to Tokyo. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Mr. 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 Lady. A VIP. Excuse me, sir. Me. Uh, yeah, okay. So, Mr. Lady. Your, for your first uh, impressions, military life. Okay. Uh, I was in the amongst the first months of a 19-year-old to be draft, drafted from the Dixon County in, in 43, Dixon County. We went to Fort Benning, Georgia, then the, through a basic training. I drove a tank for, for a couple, three times. I went out on a rifle range and won a, a medal for the, for shooting on my rifle. They went up to radio school up to Fort Knox, Kentucky, and we spent uh, about two months up there learning the Dalton Code, and I could do it, learning the Dalton Code. It was pretty rough, but we, we wanted out. And after that, we came back back to uh, Benning, and then the, the uh, battalion was recruited for a new gimmick, a secret weapon that we were given, and that was a tank with a, a, a beacon light they would light up the yard like a, at night. They would light, light up the yard at night. And then uh, we went back to uh, London for a little while, and we didn't cross the channel until the 1st of November. We got back into a, a French orchard, and it rained, and we just crawled down and got into the mud so terrible deep we could not move. We finally <laughs> got out of that, got down with six miles of Aachen when we got into the Battle of the Village. Now, we didn't know just exactly what was going on at that time. The secret was there. They were flying planes over, dropping flares, dropping bombs. We had the B-2 coming on us, and we, we kind of sat there and watched guard. We heard all kinds of stories of everything that was going on. And 
On, on, it was on Christmas Day, we had one heck of a dinner on Christmas Day. I don't know where it came from, but we had a big dinner on Christmas Day. We moved back the day after Christmas, back to Liège, Belgium, with the First Army Headquarters to protect them. And while we were back there, we were given some of our tanks had uh, dozer blades on for high work. Uh, some had roller rollers in front for mine sweeping, and also had had uh, chains for mine sweeping. And then, then we come back in January and February, we had those tanks pushed out one or two different entries, working on the roads on the bombs and the small bombs that way. Put the other. Then they they come up for some other things, and we we landed down to the the river, Rhine River. I seen the bridge before it fell down, and I watched them build the pontoons from Germany. And while we was there, uh, we picked up three frogmen coming down trying to bomb the bridge, uh, the river. And that's when we used our lighter tank. The first time we used that lighter tank, uh, the general headquarters thought for D-Day that that lighter tank might not be too practical to get on there, so we were put back. But we did use that lighter tank. There were six battalions of us that was given that tank, but we were the only ones that took it over to Europe. And use it there. And after the after the <clears throat> the uh, Rhine River deal, uh, we kind of worked up. And then when the war ended, we kind of just laxed, laxed up and played volleyball half the time. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got, when the war was over, the captain said, the, the colonel said, threw all your extra clothes out, but you couldn't put in your devil bag. And you ought to have seen the pile of clothes we had in the yard that day <laughs> that we had collected from, from going to showers. And, and, yeah, we had showers in the wintertime down there by the river and then tents. And I think one time it was 15 below zero when we come back and created a shower in the tank. How we did it, I don't know, yeah. but yeah. we survived. Yeah. And, at that, and then after the war, we were awarded a seven-day vacation picked out different ones, and I was the first one to get my name drawn for that. So I spent a week down at the Mediterranean, on the Medi at the uh, sea, nothing but rocks and coasts. Then after that, we come back home, and we was on the Lyman Abbott coming back. Yeah, we got into quite a bit of storms. Of course, the ship was still light, just food and man. And the bow would go out, and the, and the propeller would go out. But then when they dropped the A-bomb on August the 6th, the, the water got just as smooth as this tabletop. The Navy man said they'd never seen the water quite that calm, and they bombed. Well. Of course, then we come on home, but we were then delegated to get the alligator tanks for Japan, to evade Japan, the alligator tanks, to go to Fort uh, San Francisco when we got back to California. Hmm. So I come home in August, and, and uh, I waited about 60 days until we got my discharge in 1945. Uh, by the way, before I went overseas, I did stop and go home and get, get married. <laughs> and we have 75 years, March Whoa. 8th of this year. 75 years. <laughs> we, we also had our, our battalion finally got together for 20 different reunions in, ten in Atlanta, Tennessee. That's at the home of the Cracker Barrel. Uh, <laughs> home of the Cracker Barrel, Atlanta, Tennessee. Yeah, I guess that's about it. All right, all right, all right. Okay. All right. We're going to go through. We're going to go through just one more question. We you, we uh, 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 we're going to go through just one more question on the serial from each one of you, and then we want to open it up to the uh, to the floor because I know your narratives, as fascinating as they are so far, have have prompted many questions out there. I want to ask you, starting again uh, uh, down there with you, Mr. Bentman, uh, who was your best friend in the military, and why was he your best friend, or she? I was a first scout in uh, the 79th Division. Uh, I did take my training in Camp Van in Texas, not Leavenworth, and I learned the nine different weapons in 18 weeks and had KP eight times. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a lot of good eating, but anyway, uh, his name was PFC General Funderburg. He was a second scout. And uh, uh, he, uh, he was there a little bit before I was. And I, I, I don't know whether I became first scout because the first scout was lost or not. But uh, he was uh, from uh, South Carolina and his dad was a doctor. And uh, when I got wounded that day after crossing the Rhine River, by the way, 
when I crossed the Rhine River, I knew it's, I never knew how close I was going to be to where my dad was born in Germany. <coughs> Uh, come to find out it was 90 miles when I crossed the Rhine River. But uh, him and I had captured six German soldiers. It would cross at 0, 0300 hour in the morning. We had practiced for the Rhine River crossing. I found out on the Moss River for two weeks. And we did use motorized boats going across the Rhine River. And uh, anyway, that morning, I, him and I had crossed, captured six German soldiers and took them back to CP. And uh, we was told to dig a foxhole. And we dug foxholes and wasn't long, we was getting white phosphorus on us. And uh, I, everybody knows what white phosphorus are burning. So we went in this house, not too far, probably from that door, and was in that house for quite a while. And he had more experience than I did. So a little while he's, after the white phosphorus quit, he said, let's go to the foxhole. We went to a foxhole outside. He got in, and I just completely, never got completely in when the artillery shell hit the house where we'd just been standing. And uh, I can remember, I never knew exactly what was happening, but I can remember him calling medic, 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 and the red-haired medic come up there, and they took me to CP. But when I left there, to get in the ambulance to go back across the Rhine River to the regimental hospital, he was the guy that I was going to miss. Yeah. Because he was with me. Yeah. BFC General Thunderbird. Good. Good. Excellent. <clears throat> Mr. Cook, Mr. Cook, please, your best friend, and why? Okay, sir. I didn't hear you. Yep. <laughs> Your best friend in the military? And oh, why? yeah. <laughs> I, I moved around a lot. I never really got close to anybody. But uh, you'd always pick up somebody to, that you could go and talk to and have a good time with and spend a little time. Uh, I never did too much going off base. Uh, in my case, I, I, I never won place long enough to really get close to anybody, but uh, you'd always, you could always make a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. Everybody's there and doing the same thing you're doing, but I was transferred from so many different companies and regiments, and, and uh, I was over at the end of the war, and uh, only over there about six weeks, and the war was over and the main part of it, and I got in on the cleanup. <laughs> <laughs> so, but as far as getting close to any one person, I wasn't in one, uh, like I say, you have one address long enough. Yes, yeah, sir. But maybe I'd be in one place a month to three weeks, and they'd transfer me. Hmm. The main reason, when the war was over, the ones that had been there the longest got to come home. Yeah. And another one, if I would have re-upped, I could have went home. <laughs> but I did not re up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. But of course, they would have went home and then went to Japan. Yeah. The band was still going. Yeah. Germany was done. Right, right. <laughs> so, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in that case, uh, I never really got close to anybody. All right, but sir. I do remember when I don't remember his name, but one uh, practice jump. Mm -hmm. We'd all went home for vacation. Uh, uh, happened to be on my birthday on, over that period of time. When we come back, we made our sixth jump. That qualified it. Right. And he was killed on that sixth jump. Oh, no. So hmm. I, I can't really remember his name, but yes. I was kind of close to him. Yeah. That bothered me a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You never know when your time comes. Never know. No. Mr. Graziano. Well, my, my best friend, he saved my life one time. He we was out there shooting, and he knocked me to the ground just in time. Otherwise, I'd have been shot. And his, his name is Buck Barnett. Hmm. <clears throat> and we was good friends, and he, we, and he was my sidekick because I told him if anything happened to me, he'd take over. So I kept him right by my side all the time. 
Yes, sir. That's my story on that. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Kramer. I'm always trying to score. I wouldn't like these guys. I got in now. No, Horace. No, no uh, action. But my best friend, his name was Jan James McIntosh. He was uh, kind of a hillbilly from Tech, from Missouri. Mm. And uh, we we just roamed the streets in Tokyo for together. And that was about the size of it. Uh, I never heard from him much after we got a service. Uh, he went back home and. Uh, I did, and that was about the size of it. All right, sir. Okay. All right. Mr. Letty, please. I guess my one of my best buddies was uh, one of the other uh, radio uh, with us. There were six of us, Ziggy Zagoza of o Omaha, Nebraska. He never did come back to any of our reunions, but I did get up to see him a couple times in, in the, in the, before he, he died. Uh, also, another friend of mine was uh, Wayne Barton, that was a, a tank driver and from Abilene. He died here about th two, two years ago. Wayne did, so he's another one uh, there. But this uh, buddy and I were pretty good. We didn't do any drinking. <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't one of the drinking types. Of course, we did sap once in a while, but we weren't with the drinking. Goodbye. We got along pretty good, bowling and roller skating and different things and the, the fairs that we could get into at the U.S. Hill Club. That way. <laughs> so, you remember them, though. Yeah. You know, you do. You remember them. Okay. What I'd like to do now for us, right, you gentlemen, is we have about uh, about half an hour left of our program time here. So, if uh, if it's acceptable with you folks and with you, let's just open this up to uh, to you uh, to you folks out there. If you have a question, just uh, just raise your hand, and uh, if you want to ask a particular panel member, you can ask him by name. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll just leave it to the panel to, uh, to answer uh, or not. So, yes, sir. Okay, hold on and not, let me bring the microphone over to you. All right. <clears throat> Did any, yeah, can you hear me? Did any of you, you ever, ever go, oh, 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 uh, empty out a concentration camp? Or did you meet anyone who was from the concentration camps in Germany? Talking to me. Say what? I never did know. I don't think it's on. No? Good. Okay. Concentration camps. Oh. I don't know if he could hear Okay. Why don't you repeat the question? He wanted to know if any of you had uh, experienced going into one of the concentration camps. <clears throat> Can't hear it. Did you, uh, Mr. Cook? Did you uh, did you run across anybody from a concentration camp during your service? Well, and the Italians, but they was workforce. Right. They was Adolf's uh, people to what so he could use use his people someplace else. They was put them in the factory. Yes. Well, I got in yes. on cleaning up five thousand of them. Okay. And uh, they did not want to go back to Italy. By that time, they'd already hung Mussolini. The story on him, you know, they, 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 their own people hung Mussolini because he was like that with Adolf. And uh, they were really good buddies. But uh, the, the, the Italians that were left at home, they had hung him and they buried him. Now, they had to dig him back up and hang him in the square because people didn't think he was dead. <laughs> The Italians, this is what was going on about with the Italians, that they weren't sure he was dead or not. But uh, then they, but our, my problem with, with them, they did not want to go back. They had no idea what they was going back to. So many of them lost everything they had when uh, they put them in these labor camps. And uh, so it was just quite a problem with them. But when we shipped them out, uh, we ended up, I think, with five or six babies, newborn, hmm. very young. And I didn't know anything about baby. <laughs> but uh, we called in the right people to take care of them and the medics, and they took care of them. They found most of the mothers. I don't know if they found them all or not, hmm. 
-hmm. But uh, well, they had said that uh, the rumor came down that they just thought the babies would be better off in America than going back to Italy. That's what the mothers and dads had thought. I'll be. Uh, I don't know how true, but that that what part was true. Mm -hmm. Okay, sir. But anyway, they finally all went back to Italy, and that's the last I knew of them. Okay, sir. Next question, please. Gentlemen, first, I'd like to thank you for your service. And my question is, what was your most difficult day of training before D-Day? Before what, sir? Before D-Day. Okay. Your most difficult day of training before D-Day. Say it again. What? Okay. Uh, the question was, what was your most difficult day of training before D-Day? Mine was at Camp Van in Texas, uh, the long 20-mile hike with all your equipment on, and uh, uh, learning, learning uh, the uh, skill of nine different weapons. Mine happened to be an M1 when I, uh, that I carried in combat, and that was... I learned the bazooka, and I could fire, take two men to do that, and a BAR and a 30 caliber, and uh, uh, Thompson. Uh, the, I, I never did carry a grease gun. I don't know whether any of you know what a grease gun. If you look on look on Google, you'll see me standing in Czechoslovakia with a grease gun in my hand. The grease gun was made like a 45 Thompson, but it was made for $15. I understand and pretty easy to carry around. Uh, All right, sir. Anyone else, most difficult day? Okay, next question, please. So we know who the oldest gentleman is up here. Do we have anybody who went in at the age of 15 or younger? Did you go in earlier than you were supposed to? Did any, did any of you join the military before you reached the legal minimum age? Uh, my ma birthday was May the 26th, 19, born what, 26, May, May the 26th, 26, and I went in August the 1st of 44. I had already had two brothers wounded in the Pacific. <coughs> His father was a <coughs> lieutenant and uh, another brother wounded on Quadulate before I was in the service. So you were all legal when you joined the military, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Nobody backdoored that thing, right? Okay. All right. Next question, please. Good questions. What was your favorite vehicle in the war? Your favorite vehicle? Yeah. Okay. Young man wants to know, what was your favorite vehicle while you were in the war? <clears throat> Well, actually, actually, I never did uh, <clears throat> drive any of the vehicles. I never did see many of them during the war. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I would think the Jeep was probably was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what about our tanker up here? What was your favorite vehicle? <laughs> <laughs> I, what was your favorite vehicle? Half-track. Half-track, all right, half -track. all right. <clears throat> okay, not a medium tank? I spent all my time in a half-track. All right, okay, sports car, as opposed to the big one. Okay, so a half-track, young man, half-track, you know, all right? Half-track, <clears throat> wheels with tracks in the back and wheels in front. Yeah, <laughs> best of all worlds. Got a half-track. Next question, please. Over here, please. I just can't hardly hear them. I could do that. Okay, this is for you, Marvin. This is for you. Yeah. I was going to say I've known you all my life, but it's more like you have known me all my <laughs> life. And I'm just now realizing that I, I knew you were a veteran. And I knew you were in World War II, but I'm just now realizing that you were at the Battle of the Bulge. 
And I've done some reading about that, and that was a terrible battle with lots of lives lost. And I wonder, because I never talked to you about it, and I wonder how much you talked to your own family about your experiences uh, when you got home. Really, I don't think I talked very much at all for the first 30 or 40 years till we got our family reunion. When we got our, our battalion reunion, then we started to talk about it. <laughs> and uh, we, we still didn't have, uh, have our, uh, the, the, the lighter tank that we had, we didn't, didn't have it out of secrecy. It was still secret. It wasn't, it wasn't okay to, to be talked about. But I don't think I talked to my family any about that, anything about that. Well, once in a while I might have said something. I don't remember what, what at all. But I, don't, I, I never say anything to the people around her. You know, they just honored me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. I just didn't talk about it. Yeah. I don't think we talked about it much. Exactly. How can you talk about it? Exactly. Please. Uh, we've all heard the expression that um, there are no atheists in foxholes. And I was just wondering if you could comment at all at what role a soldier's faith played in his performance during a war like that. Do we have the question? How important was faith in your service, especially during periods of danger? Well, here's the Bible given to me at the Repo Depo plant, or Repo Depo plant, where I, I was started out in combat. It's signed by President Roosevelt and uh, got my name in a private for, Private Frank Benneman and my father's name, Fritz Benneman, in Frankfort, Kansas. And you can see it's pretty well worn. <laughs> <clears throat> and I asked a lot of uh, veterans that went into combat, and a lot of them can't even remember getting one of these here. Uh, I don't know why I carried it so long. I don't even know whether I looked at it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe never had time to, but. Uh, that, Anyone else want to comment on faith? Pardon? No, I, I was asking if anyone else had a comment on that question. Right? Right here, sir, please. What was the single most memorable moment you had during your combat time? Single most memorable moment during your time in combat? Well, I guess when I... Uh, hit the shore, I had to drive a gasoline truck off of the uh, LST. And when I got it on the shore, I jumped out of it quick. <laughs> <laughs> I figured I'd get one bullet would have took care of me. Yeah. So I got my uh, flamethrower uh, head with me and flares and lay down the beach with the dead soldiers. And then I creeped up under the cliff. And every time the Germans would be shooting their guns, I'd creep up a little closer till I finally got under the cliff. And once I got under there, uh, there was a machine gun up on top of it shooting down at us. So I got my flamethrower out and shot that up underneath and got all that woods on fire underneath that machine gun. So that got rid of that one. And then I got the, my flare uh, gun out and shot a flare up in the sky. And I knew the Navy would know what that was for. And they did. And they hit the target, and that got rid of a few more guns that was up there on that cliff. And then I had to, after that, I had to lay down underneath the cliff there at night. And then the Rangers were the first ones to go up the cliff. And after that, I got my men together and said, we're going to go up next. And some of them didn't have guns because they lost them in the water as they were got off of the LSTs to go ashore. And they were so heavy equipment and all, they just otherwise would have drowned if they didn't drop their guns. 
I said, go down there and get your gun off of those dead soldiers and follow me. And they did. And then we worked our way up there and fighting our way all the way through till we got to Reims, France. And then when we got there, oh, that's when I was put in charge of the, the Red School House and all of that. I guess you all heard the rest of that story. Yes, please, sir. I thought I heard Mr. Benjamin say that he had two brothers in the service during the war. Did, he have, did his mother ever share her thoughts of having three sons in harm's way? I, I don't know about that. <laughs> As I said, his father was behind Japanese lines. He's a first lieutenant. and. Uh, He's, him and I used to talk quite a bit. The other that had been wounded on Quadrilane said, but my mother had gotten these th same things from my other two brothers when they were wounded. My mother got four of these from the chaplains uh, telling how I was doing in the hospital in Cardiff, Wales. I was in the hospital for uh, th 45 days on my one day wounded. By the way, when I got wounded, I crossed the Rhine River, and I knew somewhere up there, my dad was born up there. I found out one day when I landed at Dusseldorf with a German relative, because I went over to the Rhine River, I said, I want to go over and see if I can find where I crossed. And uh, come to find out when I drove back from there, it was 90 miles. But when my older brother and I was over there on a family reunion one, they asked if anybody if the Benjamin family had been over there during World War II. And I held up my hand and they said, where? I said, Basel, Germany. <clears throat> Come to find out I had two relatives in the German army that was within four miles of me when I got wounded. Mm, my goodness, my goodness. I never knew this when my dad was alive. And uh, I, I uh, it, it's, uh, but to, to a mother, to get these kind of cards <coughs> three different times, and it tells in there each time how I'm doing. By the way, while I was in the hospital, I appraised all the nurses that took care of me, morphine and penicillin. I was in the hospital one day, and the nurse come in, she says, I got sad news for you. She said, President Roosevelt died. And I can remember, I had tears like that. And about 45 different wounded soldiers in there had the, probably the same thing. But I was, uh, I, I never knew how close I was to that day. And then uh, to show you how close, how wounded, or my, how close one of my Germans <laughs> cousin was from, I asked him, I never knew what time this was, but at 10, they found out it was 10 o'clock, all the gliders and paratroopers come across over us. And I said, ask him, I said, do you remember these coming over? He said he was shooting at them. But at, actually, the British, I found out the British also jumped at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Another question. Right here. Yes. I am, I am a veteran. I'm going to change uh, what we're talking about here now. Well, I'm, uh, I'm a, I met my wife in the Army, and it lasted for 71 years. Wow. I thought that was pretty good. Anyway, my question is, <laughs> how many of you met your wife in the Army while you were in the Army? How many of you met your wives when you were in the Army is the question. Uh, I didn't get the question. How many of you met your wife while you were in the army? <clears throat> I mean, uh, you did, Bob. <laughs> now, one of you said before you did. <laughs> yeah, you said. All right. Uh, now, we're not. We're not. We're not leaving. Mind. We're not leaving this room till you fess up. About three years. I think it was you, Mr. Graziano, wasn't it? Yeah. 
<laughs> Wasn't it him? Yeah, yeah it was him. <laughs> Mr. Graziano, yes or no, you met your wife in the military. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> mama in the military. Mm. Mama in the army. Boom. Yeah, my wife. <laughs> That'll do, Mr. Graziano. That'll, uh, that'll yeah, she, she yeah. was in the service, too. She was the staff sergeant. And I was a master sergeant, so I pulled my rank on her. <laughs> <laughs> then I, made, I made master sergeant in 23 months. Wow. And a lot, of, a lot of the soldiers told me they took them about four or five years to make it. But I made it in 23 months. And found the girl. That's not bad. That's not bad at all. All right. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, the other day, Saturday, Mr. Graziano, you told the story about getting married uh -huh. and where you went for your honeymoon and how you got there. I think you should tell that again. Well, uh... Where I went, uh, after we got married, uh, Colonel Boschoff let me use his staff car for us to go to Paris. So we went to Paris for our honeymoon. And then we was there about a week, and then we came back to camp. And of course, we couldn't live together then, so she stayed with the women, I stayed with the men. Until, and then when we left to go home, her ship left the day before my ship. So we got, uh, I got home on Christmas Day, and I figured she should have been there. So I called her up to her family's house and I found out she was from Alabama and I was from New York. And they kept telling me, no, she ain't got here yet. She ain't got here yet. And that went on for 30 days. <laughs> I figured she skipped out on me. <laughs> So then, finally, she sent me a letter, and see, uh, her ship, uh, they got in the storm and they had cracked up and they had to pull into Azor Island. So the Enterprise ship was leaving and went to the, to the States and had to turn around and go back and get them. And that's why it took 30 days for her to get there. Wow. So that, well, I know that story. Yes, sir. Any more? Um, to each of them, where were they when the war ended, and what did you do shortly thereafter? After I got back? Oh, yeah. The question is, where were you when the war ended, and what did you do immediately after? Everyone. Oh. Where were you when the war ended? Well, when I went back, I went back into my business of hairstyling. And my sister had a beauty shop. Where were you at, Papa, when the war ended? And what were you doing? Oh, when the war ended? Oh, I was, I was in Reims, France. Yep. And just putting in time for me to go back home. OK. But they uh, wanted to promote me to second lieutenant. And then, and then it made me go take a physical and all that. And everything passed. But then it was near time to go home, and they said I had to stay longer. And I was ready to go home, so I turned the, the second lieutenant down. All right, sir. Anyone else? Where were you when the war, and when you heard the war was over? I was in, uh, just got out of Cardiff, Wales on June the 4th. And uh, June the fourth, May, May the fourth, the war is over. May the eighth, and uh, I and a uh, guy from New York, uh, they said, "You you, you just being discharged out of the hospital, and you go back to your outfit." And they said, "Take as long as you want to go back." P uh, I'm just going to say his name, the other guy, but anyhow, why? Anyway, him and I messed around in uh, 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 Cardiff, Wales, and then we 
took a train up to Birmingham, England, and watched a, a, per, a parade up there on uh, the day the war was over with, and uh, went to Southampton, got on a ship, I got on a ship to uh, La Havre, and how I got back to my outfit, I have no idea. <laughs> that is a complete mystery. <laughs> and uh, got back to my outfit. And actually, when I got back to my outfit, they still had my bag and they still had my gun. But we got in some gun battles still after that because it carried live ammunition for six months. Yeah. But uh, 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 that's where I was at. Uh, I think the, I don't think the doctors wanted to send the guy back <clears throat> with, to back into combat. And it's, I think they kept me there a little longer than he should have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Final questions? One right here, please. When you came today, um, I, well, first of all, you've been answering all of, your, all of our questions so wonderfully. Was there anything that you came today hoping that we would ask that maybe has not been asked yet today? Is there something that you were really hoping to get out today to, to make sure that you shared? I would like to show you a picture of what it looked like the night we crossed the Rhine River. It was the largest artillery barrage after D-Day. Three, I found out it was 300,000 rounds of ammunition or artillery fired. And my book, when I read my book of the, of the uh, 79th Infantry Division, it says we followed a wall of steel. And the other picture in here I would like to show you is the town of Basel, where I said I crossed, and there, Basel, there's nothing left of it. Hmm. And the other picture in here I'd like to show you is the gliders, if I find it here. This book is all in German. I got it at the Romagen Bridge, my wife and I did. But I got a picture here, shows the paratroopers flying, or the gliders. There's Churchill going across. I got a good story to tell about Churchill. Now here's the, here's the picture of mm -hmm. all the gliders going across above me. And by the way, I found out I had one good friend in our church was flying one of those gliders, and he told me all about how they started, where they started out. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, by the other way, and I was telling you about the German's uh, uh, cousin. This is the picture of the German cousin. The last <coughs> trip we was over there, the, the, the wife had told me all about her dad, how he was at Basel, and so I told my German so, so story to him. Then he told the story to his daughter, and his daughter translated it to me. And the thing about it, what, what it gets me, he started to sing, I'll hang my vision on the Siegfried line if the Siegfried line was still there. And I wondered where in the heck he ever found that up. But uh, mm -hmm. th this is a picture of a, one of the German relatives. Final point, gentlemen, sort of it. Oh, yes, ma'am? Oh, no, okay, good. Uh, final point. Is there anything else that you would like us to know? Well, what, uh, <laughs> Yep. Well, I, 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 got, I was in the first division. I never had enough points to come home. You needed 55 points to come home, and I had 45 out my purple heart and, and all the combat that by the way I don't know about the combat but you know how much that combat badge paid a month paid ten dollars to go out and kill somebody <laughs> ten dollars a month I did I did draw that for four years now the paratroopers that got the 50 I, I think they deserved all of that 50 and more now <laughs> The bronze star that I got, that was given to everybody. Eisenhower signed the executive order, and everybody that got the combat badge got the bronze star. 
That's All right, so sir. you'll know that. Folks. Okay. Anything else you would like us to know, gentlemen? Uh, Mr. Graziano. I, I, was, <laughs> I was in the bed on the bulge. The reason that came up was the captain come in one night in my quarters and he says, I want you to go on a mission with me. And I says, is that a request or an order? He says, I can put it in an order. I says, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we had to go and find Patton troops were cut off up at uh, Bastogne for six weeks. And then company of the 3rd Armored Division was lost. So we had to go find them and take them to Bastogne. And we found them between reams and nets and, and found them and then we started off, we had to fight our way all the way to Bastogne. And during our fighting that way, I got frozen feet. Of course, I wasn't thinking about my feet, I was trying to stay alive. And so we got, and we took them there and after we got them up there, they freed the ones that were cut off then the captain and I went back to Reams. And when I got to Reams, they put me in the dispensary and the fluid was coming out of my feet. And uh, they says I got there just in time because it had been another day that they had to cut them off. Hmm. So, hmm. so uh, yeah. that took care of that situation. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Anything else, gentlemen? Well, unfortunately, our time is up. We said that these men symbolize greatness and sacrifice and devotion and dedication. We've heard some of the things that they did during their time in the Second World War. We need to know one other thing that they did, and we need to always remember one other thing that they did. It's not much. They saved the world. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Benjamin, you had one other thing? Uh, after I got my first discharge out of the 1st Division, I, this is after the war, though, I asked to get the Caribbean Defense Command. I got the Caribbean Defense Command and became a chauffeur for the post commander of Post Corzell, General <coughs> Colonel Wayne L. Barker. This picture I took is the only picture I've got of Wayne L. Barker. He is in the back seat with General Eisenhower. I'll be. This picture, the original picture, is in the Abilene here. And uh, uh, I, I keep looking at this picture, and General Eisenhower is looking direct at me. And I keep thinking, did I ever give him a salute? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, this, this Colonel Barker was a wonderful guy, and I've been trying to find his grandkids because this they would never have known that his uh, their grandparent had been in the back seat with General Eisenhower. I spent two years down there, the best two years of my life in the Army life. Uh, trying to show you what I did. I bought a brand new Harley down there for less than all right, all right. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir. Since he mentioned Eisenhower, uh, one night I had the, the General Thrasher came in and said, I need for you and one of your men to go put a special telephone line in for Eisenhower quarters. So we started off and we had to go through a town and some fields to get the wires that, for his telephone connection. And we did that, and we got there, we set it all up, 
and Stan spent the night there with him, and he was really good to us. And I think a lot of them, Eisenhower. And yeah. Then we went back to camp once we got his lines set up for him. Yes, sir. I got one more thing. <laughs> uh, my granddaughter down here, not too long ago, I, I, I talked to a lot of uh, high school kids. I love to talk to them. And the couple, last thing I said, don't, don't, speak, don't smoke, don't drink, and study. She, she invited me down to her school, and they never knew exactly what I was supposed to do down there. And I said to my son, I'm not driving in Overland Park at 745 in the morning. <laughs> and so he picked me up at Lawrence, and I went down there in this high school. It was full of a whole row full of veterans, and they sent me right over here in this area. Come to find out, I was the only one to talk, and there was about 500 people in this <laughs> I mean, why you see me, we're taking all of this stuff along with me. <laughs> <laughs> I love to talk to those high school. Yes, sir. Probably no, won't talk anymore, but uh, to look up and see five, and listen to them. By the way, I always talk about, you heard me talk about the nurses. I did talk about the nurses, and I talked about how they did, they did this. And I got done talking, and this lady come running down to me. She said, I got to give you a big hug. And she was standing here shaking with her hand. She said, Frank, I got Parkinson's disease. I had Agent Orange. I was a Vietnam nurse. And my son, not too much later, brought me up a book she read, had written called The Vietnam Nurse. So if you want to read this, that's a not, nice thing about it. I, I, right. I better stop talking. <laughs> right. Thank you, gentlemen.